Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Deerfield Baptist Church. As we are continuing our journey through the Book of Romans, we're actually going to skip ahead a little bit, and today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 29. If you would like to follow along, go ahead and take a second to find your, find your way there. Uh, as we dive into the text, one of the themes that I want you to really wrestle with is kind of this, this idea of the phrase that we've all heard before, which is, do as I say, not as I do. Now, a lot of us, we hear that and we think, oh, that's, it, we, we have different experiences with that kind of a phrase. But what it really kind of boils down to is some kind of hypocrisy. Uh, ultimately, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that uh, you know, I may be flawed, but that doesn't mean that what I say is flawed or wrong. And, and I think both can be equally true. And I think uh, when you when you talk to non-Christians, when you talk to people outside of the church, they say that one of the biggest issues they have with the church and with Christians is that they're all hypocrites. And to be fair, we are. Uh, we are hypocrites. Uh, we we want to follow Jesus. We claim we follow Jesus, and time and time again, we fail. Um, because we're going to, because we are sinful people. Another, on the flip side, though, I would argue that all people are hypocrites. Uh, I don't think there's a person out there who is not a hypocrite in some way in their life. And, and so it's kind of one of those things that it's like, yeah, we are, so are you, <laughs> but maybe that's not the best evangelistic tool. Uh, but it's like, we are hypocrites, and that's why we need the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why we do need to to pursue the one person who wasn't a hypocrite, who who talked the talk, who walked the walk, who did everything perfectly within the law, the only sinless human to ever walk the face of the earth. Maybe that could kind of be our thing that, you know, like, yes, I am a hypocrite. That's why I need Jesus. That's why I follow him, because he isn't a hypocrite. Um, but that being said, this is just kind of the theme uh, that, that is present in this passage. It's not the whole point of the passage, but it is part of it, is this whole idea of hypocrisy, this whole idea of talking the talk, but not walking the walk. And, and so as we dive in, this is kind of what I want you to be thinking about, because we are a people who historically have not done a great job, we in the church, especially the American church, but not only the American church, it's just we're all Americans and we're all in the American church, but the American church for a lot of time, but has really struggled to walk the walk. And, and, and like, you can see that in all the people who go to church, but don't believe what the scriptures say. The people who claim they're Christians, but don't believe Jesus is God. The people who claim that they follow Christ, but in reality, what they do is they just like some of the moral teaching there. And, and so if you truly are going to be a follower of Christ, um, then you have to admit that we have missed the mark. Um, we just have. With that being said, uh, let's go ahead and dive into the text. I, I, I will say, I don't think we are in the worst position. Um, I don't think we're in a great position, but I, 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 we're not the only ones who have ever missed the mark. Uh, in fact, everybody has missed the mark except for Jesus Christ in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we just need to keep pursuing him, and we need to do that diligently uh, with our hearts and with our actions. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, let's dive into the text. We're going to start in Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 24, in which Paul says, Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, there are a few things that I do want to point out here. Namely, is that uh, this passage is Paul talking to the Jews. He's talking to the people who, who boast in the law that they've been given, who boast in the fact that they are God's chosen people. Um, and now that has been expanded in the New Testament, whenever it talks about the nation of Israel, it's talking about the church. 
And so like the people of God aren't just uh, the Israelites, the Jews anymore. The people of God are all who are in Christ Jesus. That's a major theme in the New Testament. Um, and it's a major theme in the scriptures. Uh, but what, So there's this kind of pipeline here from the Jews to the church as a whole. But Paul's talking specifically to, in this passage, in the context it's written to the Jewish audience. And he's saying, you know, you've had the law, but you've broken the law. Like you boast in the fact that you were given the law, but you still disobey it. And I think we're the same in the church today. Like we have the gospel, we boast in Jesus Christ, and yet we we disobey him. Uh, we, we do things that he commanded us not to do, and we avoid doing things that he commanded us to do. Um, and so it's one of those things that it's like, like, look at yourself, like you teach, yes, you preach the word, but are you yourself being taught by it? You, you tell people what the gospel says, but are you yourself living the gospel? And, and Paul's really just saying like, practice what you preach. Are you listening to the words you're reading? Are you letting them live in your heart? And I can tell you, there have been times where I couldn't say that. And, and I think that we all can agree to that, but that doesn't make it right. <laughs> like just because everybody's wrong doesn't make it right to be wrong. Um, and so it's one of those things that is like, what what are we doing here? Like the importance of the law, the law is important. And Paul's going to go on to argue that the law is important and that the Jews were, uh, you know, they were special because they were chosen by God to receive the law. And that is an important thing theologically. We'll talk about that later as we go through the book of Romans. But he's like, what good is it if you're going to ignore it? Like, what good is the grace of Jesus Christ if you're going to disobey it, if you're going to ignore it, if you're going to hide it under a bushel and pretend that you don't have the light of Jesus Christ? Like, what good is it that you know what's true, that you know what's good, if you're going to do the opposite? What good is it? It's kind of like if somebody like, like this is kind of a, an odd example, but think about it. If there's a if there's a doctor out there who knows the cure to cancer, um, it's something that everybody's been affected by and they're just quiet about it. Like they know the cure to a thing that affects millions of people every single year and that everybody has been directly impacted by, whether through a family member or another loved one. And they have the cure for it, but they just sit on their hands. What good is the cure if you're not going to spread it? What good is the cure if you're just going to ignore that you know the cure? You know, it's one of those things that is like, if you know the cure to sin, if you know the cure to death, which is what the gospel is, the cure to death itself, what good is it if you ignore it? What good is it if you disobey it? What good is it if you just sit on it? It's not. It may be good news for you, but it's supposed to be good news for the world. And so like, what do we, like, what, what good is it if we are the chosen people, which we are, but what good is it if we're the chosen people, if we're not going to use that to the advantage of others? <laughs> like we're told time and time again, that, that, that like faith that is good and pure in the eyes of the Lord is faith that takes care of orphans and widows, that takes care of the people who are, who are vulnerable, that takes care of the people who have nothing, that takes care of the people you know, who need to be taken care of. And yet we're, we're, we're so concerned with like building up our own towers, building up our own wealth, building up our own security that we don't, we don't do that. We don't do what we're commanded to do. And, and I mean, like, that's one of the reasons a lot of people don't want to be a part of the church is because they read the words of Jesus and, and they see how Jesus acted. And they're like, but Christians don't do that. You know, Jesus says, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And especially around election season, we like to point the finger and say, you're evil. You're the worst because you're voting for someone different than I am. Or you're the reason America is going to fall and stuff like that. And it's like, do you really believe God is in control? Like, do you really believe that who gets voted as president is more important than the fact that the gospel is spread? Do you really believe that? Are you a person who believes what the scriptures teaches? Do you believe God is who he says he is? Or, or do you, like, what, what do you believe? Just because a person votes red or blue doesn't make them less or more evil than you. You are evil. You are sinful. 
just as much as they are. They're not the enemy. They're not. And the problem is a lot of people don't want to be part of the church because we've spent so much time being comfortable in our politics that we have forgotten to be uncomfortable in living out the gospel. Because living out the gospel isn't comfortable. Like Jesus says, follow me, take up your cross, take up your execution tool and follow me. Die to yourself every single day. It's not about you anymore. It's about him and his kingdom. And we don't do that. And people notice that. And so they don't want to follow Jesus because we're really no different than the rest of the world. We're just more closed minded. And I don't think that's what the gospel's about. I don't think that's what scripture's about. And I know judging Jesus based just on his followers isn't logical in its own way. But when the followers do such a poor job of pointing to him, I don't blame people. Like, there are sports teams that I refuse to support because the fans are annoying. <laughs> so why would I follow a God whose believers are hard-hearted, close-minded, and cruel? And they spit poison everywhere that they go. Like, why would I want to follow a God whose followers did that? And yet they claim, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. They claim, turn the other cheek. They claim that they follow a God who says to take care of the poor, to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. And yet they do none of it. So like, you understand, like, people outside of the church don't want to be a part of the church because the church seems like it's not doing what it claims it's doing. And that's been going on for a while. You see, the law was given to the Jews and they disobeyed it. The gospel's been given to us and we disobeyed it. And Paul continues in verses 25 through 27 and says circumcision has value. And he's talking about obedience to the law, uh, specifically in the act of circumcision, because it is outward, because it is physical. And he says circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. And so I think a good way to translate this to us, because this, again, this is like Jewish law 2,000 years ago. It's not something that we really have to wrestle with, but a good way to translate this, like, we like to pick certain laws and certain rules that we want to follow in the Bible. We really do. And they're, they're the ones that are easy to show outwardly. Uh, we like to practice communion. We're commanded to practice communion. We like to practice baptism. We're commanded to be baptized. But yet we keep parts of our heart hidden away in the darkness. And we like to say this sin is bad because it's easy to see. But really, we have greed in our hearts. We have adulterers in our church. We have people who do so many things that are evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, Scripture teaches that gossip is evil in the sight of the Lord, and yet we do it in our churches. And so one of the things that we really have to wrestle with is like, <laughs> Are we truly following Jesus in our hearts, or is it something that we're just kind of going through the motions? Like we're doing the things that we're told to do, and we're avoiding the things that we're told to avoid, hoping that that is enough to save us? Or do we truly have a transformed heart? And I'm going to get into that in just a second, because that's actually where Paul goes. But like, we can be the same as these people, as the Jews in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, praising the outward actions of other Christians and praising ourselves for going through the motions, all the while our heart is wrought with sin. And we aren't a person who's truly obeying Jesus. We're not a person who's truly following Jesus. And so when you look at yourself, I need you to think like, Am I truly following Jesus? Am I doing these things? Am I marking these things off a list because I know that's what Jesus wants me to do? Or am I doing it so that I look like a good Christian? 
Am I doing it so that I look good to the people in the church? Because I guarantee you there are so many people in churches who do it purely to look good. They do it purely so that they can they can feel good about themselves. And you know what? You're still doing good things, but you're doing them for the wrong reasons. And the heart is what God is concerned with. And that's why Paul continues in verses 28 and 29 and says this, a person is not a Jew who is the who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. And what Paul is saying here is that, again, I'm using kind of this Jew to Christian pipeline that I established earlier, is that like, you're not a Christian just because you do the right things. You're a Christian because your heart belongs to Christ. You're not a Christian just because you don't do certain things. You're a Christian because your heart belongs to Christ. Now, if your heart belongs to Christ, truly, you are going to avoid certain things and you are going to go out of your way to do certain things. That's part of it. When you're in love with somebody, you're going to change how you act. When you get married, you don't date around anymore. When you get into a committed relationship with somebody, you're going to alter the way that you do stuff to make them happy and to show them your love. That's how it goes. Like, that's what it is to love. And when you love God, when you love Jesus, you are going to stop going to the other gods in your life. You are going to start doing things that look like what Jesus did. You are going to start following in his example. That's what it is to love Christ. But it starts with your heart. God is concerned with our actions. If he wasn't concerned with our actions, then he wouldn't ever talk about them and it wouldn't be in the scripture. And the scripture's full of stuff about our actions. But it always comes down to the heart and that's what he's most concerned about. He is concerned about your heart. Where is your heart? Who does your heart belong to? Does it belong to your money? Does it belong to your stuff? Does it belong to your employer? Does it belong to your loved ones? Does it belong to you? Or does it belong to Jesus Christ? Is your heart lining up with your actions? I think that's a good question to ask yourself. Sometimes, sometimes you do need to act when your heart is not in it. That is true. Because that's... (laughs) You have a flawed heart, you have a human heart, you have a fallen heart, you are going to have days where your heart is not in it. And it's okay if you do just do the actions with your heart not quite lining up. Um, But is your heart generally in line with what you do? I think that's an important question to ask yourself. Are you keeping parts of yourself out of the light? And by that, I mean, are you holding on to parts of yourself for yourself? Or have you fully given yourself over to Jesus Christ? Are there parts of yourself that you keep hidden in the darkness? Do you have sins that you struggle with in secret? Uh, do you have certain things that you you hold on to as a security that you haven't given over to Jesus Christ? Are there things that you do because of your doubt? Are there things that you do because of your comfort? Are there things that you do because you don't want to give up that fun or that pleasure? That's the question. If you have a heart completely sold out for Jesus Christ, yes, you're still sinful. You are still going to fall. But you're not going to keep those parts hidden in the dark. Because Jesus is the light of life, and if you are truly sold out for him, if you are truly giving yourself over to him, those things have nowhere to hide. And that's a good thing. Yes, you will have to face, uh, you know, the the consequences of your action, but that's, that's, that's a good thing that you don't get to do everything with no consequence. Like that is a good thing. Discipline is a good thing that a loving parent does. And so I kind of want to end this little section on this, and then we're going to, we're going to start to land the plane, but are you a Christian in like your words and actions only, or 
where is your heart? Does it belong to Jesus Christ? I need you to ask yourself that question. Like, do you go to church and do you, are you a Christian because you go to church or because you do X, Y, Z, or because you don't do X, Y, Z? Are you a Christian in that way? Or are you a Christian because you're somebody who has fully given your heart over to Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian because you recognize your need for salvation from your sin and have given yourself to the only one who can save you? That is what it is to be a Christian. That is what it is to follow Christ. Yes, there are actions that go along with it, but just doing the actions isn't going to save you. Scripture's clear about that. Like, if you're relying on your own good deeds and your own avoidance of sin, if that's all you rely on to give you salvation, I'm sorry, but Scripture's clear, you will not be given it. You can only find salvation in Jesus Christ. And if your heart is not his, then it's it's Satan's. <laughs> And I know that sounds harsh, but like that is what the scriptures teach. So I need to ask you again, I need you to ask yourself, like, are you a Christian in word alone or is your heart, does it belong to Jesus Christ? So this is where I want to land. This is where I want to conclude. Uh, I, I want to assure you, reassure you, I guess, that the gift of salvation is there for anybody. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you're currently doing. Jesus Christ is like, he is willing to accept you. He is willing to give you that salvation. He is here. He loves you. And it's not something that he does begrudgingly. It's something that he does with joy. God loves you. He wants you to come home. He wants to have your heart. He wants to have you, all of you even your baggage, even your mess, even your history, even the mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter. He wants you. And your only response is to come to him in humility, <laughs> in love, in gratitude for the grace and the salvation that he offers, because it's not something that's just a get out of hell free card. It's not just a ticket into heaven. It's salvation here and today from the sin and the death that we are stuck in. He can pull us out of those depths and bring us into new life now. And that's the beauty. And I want to reassure you of that, that like, I know a lot of what Paul is saying seems harsh, but like Jesus, the, the opportunity is there. And it's not something that you like, it's not something that you can work your way out of. It's something that he is always willing to reach the hand out and pick you up. You just need to accept it. And it's not going to be necessarily an overnight change in most cases. A lot of the time it does take time, but that's fine because he will do the work in you that needs to be done if you simply give yourself over to him. And so I think what we can take from this passage, I, I, again, I want you to be encouraged. His arms are open come home. But what we can take from this passage is that we as the church need to be a people who belong to Jesus Christ and to strive toward holiness inside and outside of ourselves. But we need to be a people who don't hold ourselves in the darkness or any part of ourselves in the darkness. We need to let them be exposed to the light of Jesus Christ. And we need to, to be a people who do hold the heart as the most important. Jesus even teaches when he's dealing with the Pharisees, like, why do you clean the outside of the cup instead of the inside? Like, we need to clean our insides. And the only way we can do that is with the Holy Spirit. Like, it's not something you and I can do on our own. And I think that a lot of the times when you hear a sermon, when you listen to Christians talk, it sounds like all they care about is behavior modification and fitting into a mold. Um, and... and to be fair, the mold of Jesus Christ is what we should all be attaining to. It really is. Um, and, and there is some behavior modification that comes along with following Jesus Christ. Like you're going to work on your behavior. You're going to want to change that to be more like Christ. But let me tell you, the gospel is about so much more than just behavior modification. The gospel is about the God who created everything. The God who sustains everything. Turning hearts of stone 
into hearts of flesh. And that's something neither you or I can do. That's something only he can do, and he wants to. We only need to come to him. Would you pray with me? Father, you are good. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to dive into your word and uh, just to hear what you do have for us. Let us be a people who, who, who do seek to know you through your word, who do seek to understand who you are and to, to know the goodness that lies only in you. God, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the opportunity to be called your children. Let us be a people who, who, who take that seriously and who are changed from the inside out, that we, that we become more like you in everything that we do and that our hearts are changed to point everyone else to you. God, let your light shine in us and through us and uh, may, may we breathe you in and just be a people who everything that we do points back to you. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Love you all.